Alrighty, let's go, go, go. Okay, um, hello everyone. I, I hope you're all uh, well and good. Uni is now in week three, so it's, um, you, you should be starting to get into the vibe of things now and everything should be, uh, you know, not so new and strange anymore. I hope you're still doing the um, sort of things we talked about in the first lecture, which is trying to sit next to new people each time, trying to sit in new seats each time, not always. I don't know if I mentioned that. You shouldn't always sit in the same seat. That's no good. Your brain will rot if you do that. It's very good to move and look at the world from different angles. I find when I'm playing a game of chess, uh, just when I think I completely understand the game, if I move a little bit to the side, suddenly the board looks completely different. I get all these new insights, and it's fantastic. So uh, do that in your computing. Don't always sit in the same seat. Don't always listen to the same radio station. You know, just don't always do the same thing. Do different stuff. Particularly now, in the first couple of weeks, you guys are all uh, able to make new friends in this uh, exciting period. In a couple of, maybe in a month or two's time, you'll all be old hands, and this magic period where you're allowed to make new pen friends will start to fade away, and you'll be stuck with the friends you've made already. Uh, and, and maybe um, uh, that's not as good as making heaps new friends. So make sure every lecture you sit in a new spot and then say hello to the person you're sitting next to and introduce yourself to them. And why don't you even do that now? Look to some weird stranger you're sitting next to that you've never seen before and say hello and what your name is. All right, stop now. No more fun. Did you say hello to someone? Yeah. Did you say hello? You Say hello to the girl there. Say hello. Yeah, yeah. Well done. Um, okay, shh, shh. everyone except those two. Please, please just make a habit of always saying hello to people. It's a hard thing to do, but you will be so glad in three or four years' time that you did it. It's absolutely fantastic. Because you guys will be with each other now for the next three or four years. You'll see each other all the time. How much nicer if you're friends and know each other? And certainly I see that amongst the third and fourth year students. They're always helping each other, looking out for each other, getting each other job interviews, um, giving each other awesome references, you know, just helping each other with ideas as well when people are down or stuck. You know, friends all help each other. If you miss a lecture, your friends will cover for you and tell you the stuff you've missed. It's just fantastic to make friends. So please do make sure, don't just stick with one or two, say hello to new people every lecture for at least the next month. After that, you're probably not allowed to anymore or you'll be a weirdo. But for the next month, it's a completely normal thing to do. You can't see what's happening in the bottom. That's the best part. Perhaps next time you should get closer to the front. No, I'm just teasing you. I'm teasing you. you need to... Uh, I don't know how to fix that problem. If only there was some way of, of, of moving the screen up. Drag the window. Ah, oh, you guys are lateral thinking, problem solving people. There you go. I, I just want to revise binary. Why binary, by the way? Why is it called binary? What's the bi mean? Two. Yeah, yeah. What are other sort of number systems? Ternary, yes. That's a, well, that's a bird-based system. What about one based on digits? That is, that is a digit. I thought it was based on turns. No, it's, it's three. no I know. I'm being silly. I'm being silly. I'm being silly. Yes, ternary. Uh, there's heaps of them. Uh, I'm sure there's septuary. Octal is interesting. That's base eight. Decimal. Decimal. We're going to use a lot in the course. That's our normal one. And hexadecimal. And hexadecimal. Okay, so binary is base 2, decimal is base 10, hexadecimal is base 16. What does the base mean? Well, you know if I said 1917 in decimal, what I'm meaning is there are 7 lots of 1, there's 1 lot of 10, there's 9 lots of 10 squared, and there's 1 lot of 10 cubed, which we call 1,000. Yeah, yeah, that's how decimal works. And similarly, in binary, we did it with, um, and why is it called decimal? Dec means 10. There's 10 different digits you can use. The digits are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then you get back up to the number 10, which is made of two of those digits. So we've got 10 basic atoms, 10 ingredients to use. Binary has two ingredients. What are they? 0 and 1, or they could just as easily be black and white, noughts and cross, anything like that. Yeah. 
7 and 8. They could be anything you want. Just two. Inside the computer, they're normally stored as 0 volts and 5 volts, for example. It doesn't matter what it is. It's just got to be two different values that are distinguishable from each other. We did black and white in the lecture last week. And so if I write the number, here's uh, my black and white. This is how I'm going to do black. This is how I'm going to do white. All right. That's a number. This is how many ones. This is how many twos. This is how many two squares, which are fours. This is how many two cubes, which are eights. Just write all the doubling numbers going along forever. We only need to do the first four because all the rest are zeros. Uh, what is this number equal to? Six. Six. Yep. Two, it's got one lot of two squared and one lot of two. So one lot of four and one lot of two. So this is six. Hexadecimal works similarly. Well, let me just write all the. Um, let's just quickly write the binary numbers out. 1s, 2s, 4s, and 8s. If I was systematically going to write them out, what's a reasonably good order to write them in? What would I write first, probably? 0, 0, 0, 0, which is equal to? 0. 0, 0, 0, 1, which is equal to? 1. 0, 0, 1, 0, which is equal to 2. I'm actually going to write them all out, but it's very, very small. 0, 0, 1, 1, which is equal to 3. 0, 1, 0, 0, which is equal to 4. Oh, we're nearly halfway there. Uh, 0, 1, 0, 1, which is equal to 5. 0, 1, 1, 0, which is equal to 6. 0, 1, 1, 1, which is equal to 7. And now we really are halfway there. 0, uh, oh, 1, 0, 0, 0, which is equal to 8. 1, 0, 0, 1, which is equal to 9. 1, 0, 1, 0, which is equal to 10. 1, 0, 1, 1, which is equal to 11. 1, 1, 0, 0, which is equal to 12. 1, 1, 0, 1, which is equal to 13. Oh, we're so close. What are we going to reach? 1, 1, 1, 0, 14. Our biggest possible number is 1, 1, 1, 1, which is 15. And that's sort of like the 9, 9, 9, nines you get in the decimal system before you roll over to the next big thing. But here it's just 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay, so there's 16 possible numbers you can represent with four binary digits. What do we call a binary digit, by the way? It's got a shorthand. We call it bit. Yeah, binary Dig it <laughs> is a bit. So this four bit numbers, there are 16 four bit numbers. Okay, so when we created the, um, our first computer chip, which I suppose it was our first serious one was the 4004, wasn't it? That was a reasonable chip. People were saying, why are you calling it a four? What's the four here? We had the 4001, the 4002, the 4003, the 4004. What's the four doing here? And then other people were asking, how come when you store values inside this thing, you can only store the numbers zero to 15? Do you see that, they're, that each of those sort of answers the other? It's a four-bit machine. So it's got the microprocessor that does all the calculating, and it looks up the values in memory, which we drew it looking a bit like this, didn't we? That's our memory. But really, there's a chip on the side with wires going to it, and we fetch and load things from memory and write them back out. And our memory chip had 16 addresses, and in each location, each memory cell, it stored four bits. So physically inside the chip, if you could zoom inside, for each of these memory uh, cells, Four things are stored. I'm drawing circles. I don't mean zeros. I mean there's four little areas there. And each of those areas is either going to store zero volts or five volts. So this one might store, I don't know, zero, five, five, zero. It's stored in these four places, which we're saying that's our memory address number zero, one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. At memory address twelve, we're storing zero, five, five, zero. What number are we really storing there? Six. Yeah, yeah. That's six there. So why do we only store four bits per cell? Why do we only store four bits? That only lets us store numbers between 0 and 15. That seems incredibly frustrating and limiting. Why didn't we say store eight bits per cell? We can't afford it. What, what about it means, what, what, what's the expense here? You need more memory. And memory on a chip means space, means extra transistors, means extra fabrication costs. So if we're really not so good at making chips, though at the time in the 70s we thought we were fantastic at them, say or the 60s, but we didn't realize how much more miniaturization lay ahead of us, making something to store 1, 2, 3, 4 times 16, uh, what's that, 64, this stores 64 bits. Six transistors a bit. Yeah, six transistors a bit, that's, and some extra overhead and stuff moving around. That's quite a lot of transistors. To squish it into a small little memory chip is quite an astonishing feat. 
If we wanted to store eight, we'd have to double the size of the thing, and that would probably at least double the cost of the thing and generate more heat and consume more power. And blah, blah. So in the early days, it was a bit of a trade-off. we say, well, you can have 16 addresses, and they're four bits each, or you could have eight addresses that were eight bits each, or you could have 64 addresses that were one bit each. You see, there's this sort of trade-off, but somehow the physical amount of transistors we need affects how much memory we can store in this chip. What's an obvious improvement to our chip to make it more useful? Yeah, let's go to 8 bits. Let's get more memory. This is really a restriction. It's really annoying to only have programs that are at most 16 bits, bytes long. And it's really annoying to only be able to store numbers between 0 and 15. If we double the number of bits, if we actually stored 8 bits in each cell, what's the biggest number we can now store? 255. We can store between 0 and 255 in each cell. Because if I went and played this game here, but I did it with 8 bits, these would be all leading zeros at the moment. I could keep going down and down and down and down and down, and I'd actually be able to find 256 different combinations. I don't expect you to list them all, but I expect you to be able to work them out. For example, if I said to you, oh, how do you write, uh, um, I was going to say 100, but that's confusing because it looks like binary. How do you write um, 99 in binary? What's that? How do you write bad? Well, we're not up to bad yet, but we're nearly bad. We'll be bad soon. How do you write 99 in binary? Does anyone know? Well, let's keep, let's keep playing our game here. We had 1s, 2s, 4s, 8s. What's next? 16s, then what? 32s, then what? 64s, then what? 128s. Well, there's no 128s in it. How many 64s are in it? 1. How much does that leave? We had 99. We spent 64. We've got... 35 left. All right, how many 32s are in it? One. One. How much have we got left? Three. Three. So there's no 16s, no 8s, no 4s. Okay, so 99 is 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. Whew. That's a number we can now store because how many bits do we need to store that? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. We only use 7 bits really, so this extra 8 bit doubles the number. Yeah, there's a certain number of them with that zero and then that same number again with that one. So you notice every time you add a bit, you're sort of doubling the number of numbers you can store. So it'd been convenient to store um, eight bit numbers. So let's say that over this week, while you guys are slaving away at task one, stretching your brains, exercising your minds, um, we'll be out the back slaving, trying to produce our miniaturization, trying to make things smaller and smaller and trying to produce a chip, which is eight bits wide for you. What should we call it? Not the 4004. The 8008. Well, the 8008? well let's call it the 8004. Let's leave all the instructions exactly the same and just double the size of memory. So it's going to be equivalent to the 4004, but it's going to have twice as much memory. Isn't that exciting? Whoa. Imagine the awesome things we can do with that. Now, so you've seen decimal, you've seen binary. Are there any questions about that? Are you reasonably confident you could fool round? Hang on. Uh, are you reasonably confident you could fool round? And if I gave you a decimal number, you could convert it to binary. And if I gave you a binary number, you could convert it to decimal? All right, so you understand binary, you understand decimal, but I really want you to understand hexadecimal. So let's look at that. Hexadecimal is base 16. So if we change our previous example and get some light over here, for heaven's sake. Aziz, light. Here we go. We're going to look at hexadecimal. Now, what are the numbers across the top in hexadecimal? Well, it starts with ones, but we've got 16 possible digits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't read the board? You, why is that? It's, the shadow's too sort of long and eerie. That's, no, the front lights are broken. If I could turn them on, I wouldn't. Is that better? <laughs> let's, let's see. How's that? You know, there's someone now who can't see it who's right. Oh. It's you. You can't see anything, can you? No. That's right. You just listen and reconstruct it mentally. All right. So we got one. What's, uh, um, so base 16 means we've got 16 different digits. Now, with binary, it was easy to go to two digits. We already know nine, so we just had to throw seven of them away, and we stayed with zero and one. But with hexadecimal, we need 16 different digits. We only know 10 digits, zero to nine. So we have to invent some new ones. And because we're going to have to type them, we don't want to invent new ones that our typewriter doesn't know. So what are our new digits going to be? We need six new digits. A, B, C, D, E. That's right. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine are our familiar digits, and we'll also have A, B, A will be 10 then, yeah, 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 B, C, D, E, and F, and F will be, if you keep counting, 15. 
So our first column is going to be how many ones? Our second column is going to be how many 16s? Our next column is how many 16 squareds, which we already worked out was how many 255s? 56s, thank you. Our next column is 16 cubes. Okay, go on, go on, go on, go on. Bad, let's write bad. B A D. All right, how many ones are there? 13, thank you. I should write them next to each other, shouldn't I? A has 10, B is 11, C is 12, D is 13, E is 14, F is 15. So there's 13 lots of 1. Plus, how many uh, 16s are there? 10. Oh, that's lucky. We can do that easily enough. 16 times 10. Uh, oh, I'm writing that backwards, aren't I? I should do it like this. 10 times 16. Plus, and how many 255s? 11 of them. So 11 times 256. I just said 255 to throw off the guy who can't read what we're saying. Um, can someone add those numbers together? I reckon I could. Uh, go, we'll have a race on your marks. So that's uh, 13 plus 160 plus uh, 2560 plus 2, uh, six, zero plus 256 is adding them up. Nine. Uh, 12, 13, 18. Oh, it's a mess. One, two, four, nine. Is it two, nine, eight, nine? Two, nine, eight, nine. Don't do comp two, nine, eight, nine. What do you think of that course? Bad. It's bad. It's not good. Whereas it, it's interesting because if you turn one, nine, one, one into hex, it spells cool. That's why we picked it. Okay. So does everyone now understand hexadecimal, binary, and decimal? Okay, we're going to put a lab or two question on it this week. So practice at home if it almost made sense but didn't quite, or if you want to solidify what you learnt just then. What's something bad? Yes. Trolling. <laughs> don't do that. That's, that's, just don't even think about it. That's no good at all. Trolling is just asking questions when you don't want to know the answer just to get a reaction out of someone. Don't do it because we've all only got a limited amount of time to answer the forums and they're sort of powered by goodwill. Um, so I grab little 10 minutes here and 10 minutes there when um, uh, you know, people aren't looking at home. I get to jump on. I've only got precious short time. Uh, and if, if you ask stupid questions just for a joke, then I'll probably end up answering those stupid questions because I never, ever think a question's truly stupid. I'm always assuming there's some wisdom hiding there behind it. Uh, and then that will have used up my time to answer genuine questions people got. So don't do that because it's sort of uh, antisocial. What else is bad? The sound coming out of the speakers is bad. What's it saying to you? <laughs> What's that? Everyone. What's it saying? Kill everyone. Kill everyone. Is your, have you got a Danish accent? <laughs> Swedish. Oh, <laughs> they're your neighbours, so you must find them really. No, we like them now. In fact, you're my rival coming from Sweden now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know I was just joking about Danes. I think they're awesome. Search. Searching. Oh, searching is good or bad? Searching. Yeah, 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 not searching. Yeah. <laughs> you should search. There's a search feature. So if you're going to ask a question, search for a couple of the keywords from the questions just to check it hasn't been answered before. So bad things, yes? Terrible grammar and punctuation. Terrible grammar and punctuation. That's me. You're having a dig at me, aren't you? Um, do try and make your post communicate. That's right. We're, it's not an English class, but we need everything to communicate quickly. Um, basically, asking a question that's already been asked is bad. Doing, don't use caps lock. Yes, that's right. That's bad because um, that's shouting. Don't, uh, here's something that people are often inclined to do. They're asking one question. So we've got a heading up there. We're saying someone said, when is the task one due? And there's a couple of discussions from various people debating when task one's due. And someone says, oh, and by the way, how does mod work? In the middle of a comment. And then people start answering the mod. And then suddenly this, this topic is about nine different things. And someone deciding whether to read or not is only going to look at the name of the topic. So they're going to see when's task one due, not knowing inside of 50 comments about how mod works. That's really depressing. It means if we start doing that, everyone has to read every single thing on the forum to make sure you're not missing important stuff. We don't want to do that. Life's too short to do that. So only ask one question per topic. Don't even ask a question. I've got six questions. Here they are. And bang, 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 bang. Ask them all in one post. 
because what title are you going to give? Some questions. Is that a, is that a good? Now everyone's got to read that because no one knows what the questions are. I have a separate post for each question and literally say what it is. So I want to know um, why Denmark is so cool. And then people that don't like Denmark won't read that. Okay? And I want to know when task one is due. People that want to know, does that make sense? So one question, well, inf uh, an informative title, one question per post. Don't split and drift off topic. Um, uh, and be nice to each other. That's probably the other thing. Treat each other with respect. Um, don't sort of get abusive or nasty or anything like that. Just be polite. The other thing that might not be obvious is if someone does something good, what should you do if you're part, all part of the same team? Assume this whole class is a t big team working together. Someone does something good, what are you going to do? You're going to like it. You're going like to click thanks. You're going to say thank you. You're going to click I like that. Now, the way the forum works is that things people like a lot move up towards the top. So that means more useful things will be closer to the top. And it also means the person who went to all that trouble to answer the question gets a like appearing next to it, which increases their karma and makes them really happy. It means next time they're more unlikely to help again, and it's just really nice. It's a nice community thing to do. Ask, yes? Are we expected to check that the input is valid? No.